Hi there. So as you can probably see, I'm taking a break from making videos about albums I love, and instead doing the opposite. Making a video about some of the worst albums of all time. I'm not just talking about albums that aren't my personal cup of tea, nor am I talking about really divisive albums by popular bands like Nickelback or Imagine Dragons. As much as I'd like to tear into an Imagine Dragons album, because I haven't heard one of their albums before, but I bet they're proper shit. No, I'm talking about albums that are almost unanimously agreed to be some of the most awful, bloated, or just horribly executed albums the world has ever seen. And some of these alleged albums are contained on a Wikipedia page called List of Music Considered the Worst. There are 14 albums listed on this page that are singled as some of the worst, or even the worst, by various publications and people. And I intend on going through all 14 of these albums listed and giving you a rundown on each, profiling the artists, or maybe I should say artists in some cases, describing what makes these albums so universally hated, and lastly, whether I think the album really deserves the overwhelming hate it's gotten. I figure the answer will be yes for all of these albums, but honestly, who knows, there could be some surprises. So the Wikipedia page lists the albums in chronological order, and I do plan to do this series in that order. But the first album listed is the 1969 album Philosophy of the World by The Shags, and I feel like starting with that would be too predictable, I guess. Not only is it possibly the most famous album on the list, but it also has a surprisingly mixed reception. So I want to save that one for later and show everyone the lesser known albums, open everyone's minds to a whole new world of shitty music. So I'm going to start with the next album on the list from 1970 called Lord Such and Heavy Friends by Screaming Lord Such. Screaming Lord Such, 3rd Earl of Harrow, or David Edward Such as he was born, was probably better known as a public figure in England for his contributions to politics more than music. First he stood for elections in the 60s representing the National Teenage Party. At one stage I noticed there was a lot of young people coming to me with two or three kids and they couldn't vote. So I thought this was rather strange, they couldn't vote until they were 21, although they could have a grown up family. Then in the 1980s he founded the official Monster Raving Loony Party, which is one of those political parties that pretty much only exists for one reason, because it can. No, there haven't been any official monster raving loony party members that have been elected to office. In fact, the party's current leader, Howling Loud Hope, who was elected as co-leader of the party alongside his cat, Cat Mando, in 1999, although the cat died three years later, came last in a 2001 election behind a man who claims to be the reincarnation of King Arthur. Meanwhile, Such himself still holds a record after running in more than 40 elections, and of course losing every single one. Although in one election in 1990, he did manage to beat the candidate from the Social Democratic Party. Unsurprisingly, that party dissolved just days after this loss. But Lord Such did first taste fame as a singer. Maybe infamy is the more accurate word, but I think all press was good press for him as far as he was concerned. His stage name was inspired by 50s performer Screamin' Jay Hawkins, whose flamboyant wardrobe and unusual stage props are seen as one of the first examples of a musical style known as shock rock. This is also the style that Lord Such's music could largely be summed up as, or more accurately, horror rock. His band was Screaming Lord Such and the Savages, who played garage rock and roll with blues influences, while Such, and sometimes the rest of the band as well, wore strange costumes and performed unique antics like emerging out of a coffin on stage. A few times they even dressed as Roman soldiers and performed under the name Lord Caesar Such and the Roman Empire. The band's best known song was Jack the Ripper, a cover of a song written and performed by Clarence Stacy and others in 1961. It's punctuated by screaming, I mean it's in the guy's name after all, but overall it's just goofy 60s rock and roll that nowadays is about as scary as the bloody monster mash. A quick listen to some other songs by the Savages suggests to me that this was what all their songs were like. And one of them even has verses that are stylistically similar to the Monster Mash. Well it was hot last night at the movie show I parked my baby in the very last row Though some songs encapsulate the horror vibe a bit better, particularly the atmospheric intro of Till the Following Night. <laughs> Jack the Ripper stands out as it's also been notably covered by English band The Horrors on their debut album, and even performed live by The White Stripes, which no doubt were both inspired by Such and the Savages version. So Such as earlier music has been largely overlooked, but when it has gotten attention it seems to show a more positive reception. So what went wrong with Lord Such and Heavy Friends? The craziest thing to me about the infamy surrounding this album is that Lord Such performed with some pretty big names even before the star-studded Heavy Friends album. 
One of the band's earliest members was a young Nicky Hopkins, who would go on to be a respected session pianist, playing with many bands including the Rolling Stones, The Who, and The Kinks. A young Richie Blackmore, later of Deep Purple, also played with the Savages quite a few times, and while the band's long-standing drummer Carlo Little didn't become a massive name, his powerful hitting of the drums clearly inspired 16-year-old Keith Moon, who convinced Carlo to get him some drum lessons. And Lord Such and Heavy Friends is notable for being the biggest example of Lord Such being able to draw some big musical names, including some who were already fairly big at the time. Such brought in legendary guitarist Jeff Beck and Noel Redding, the bassist for the Jimi Hendrix experience for a few of this album's tracks, and also Nicky Hopkins, who was still around then, having now played with the Stones and the Kinks. But undoubtedly, the biggest names involved are Jimmy Page and John Bonham of Led Zeppelin, who play on the most tracks out of all the guests involved. Page was also credited with co-writing a few songs with Such and as the main producer of the album, but Page is also one of the album's biggest critics. Not long after it was released, he called the whole thing an embarrassment and a joke that reversed itself and became ugly. Rolling Stone magazine shared his sentiment, saying that the music made the stars involved in the project sound like a foul parody of themselves, and calling Such absolutely terrible. Then again, Such might not have completely disagreed with that last thought, since he's apparently admitted himself that he's not a great singer. Also, in a 1998 BBC poll, Lord Such and Heavy Friends was named the worst album of all time. But, the song Flashing Lights from the album appeared in the 2017 film Logan Lucky, so I guess whoever coordinated the soundtrack for that is a rare Heavy Friends fan. Other than that, the album looks set to be a doozy for anyone who's bold enough or just really curious to listen to this album. When a famous artist like Jimmy Page tells everyone that an album he worked on is crap, then maybe he has a point. And now having listened to Lord Such and Heavy Friends myself, I can confirm it's... not even that bad. In fact, I actually quite like some of these songs. Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? Well, I sure didn't think I'd already be defending an album in the first episode of this series, but yep, that's what I'm doing. Does Lord Such and Heavy Friends have its flaws? Of course it does. But worst album ever? Out of all the shitty records people could have chosen from, this is the one that most people singled out? I just don't really get it. Of course, the most notable flaw is Lord Such's vocals. He knew that he wasn't a great singer, and yeah, he wasn't wrong there. But there have been plenty of successful bands and musicians with voices that are almost objectively awful, especially when you're looking at punk bands. Hell, Mick Jagger ain't no vocal virtuoso, yet he's driven one of the world's biggest bands for nearly 60 years with his voice. Lord Such's singing doesn't exactly stick out for me as an obviously terrible vocalist. Based on the album's status, I was expecting some tone-deaf wailing, or vocals that are just Chad Kroger levels of grating in some other way. But to me, that's far from the case. Besides, his style of performing kind of cancels out his vocal flaws, or at least tries to. He was raw, loose, and very much theatrical, and his singing reflected this as well. But the key thing is is that he was clearly having fun, which can often go a long way when your vocals are generally pretty limited. So like I said, Lord Such basically is a terrible vocalist, but personally I reckon he still managed to make it work most of the time. The other main flaws of Lord Such and Heavy Friends are a little harder to defend. The production certainly isn't amazing. The legend is that many of the musicians involved assume that these were just demo recordings, which would certainly explain that. The other criticism is one that generally applies to Lord Such's musical career as a whole, I believe, and that's the lack of originality songs. I mean, keep in mind, Jack the Ripper and that song that sounds like the Monster Mash. This continued a bit on Heavy Friends, with some songs heavily based on the whole 12 bar blues thing, others where Page and Bonham's trademark Led Zeppelin styles poke through. Meanwhile, the song Gutty Guitar sounds like a rock and roll tune from the 50s. Such seemed pretty content with pushing 50s music well past its use by date. His follow up to Heavy Friends in 1972 unashamedly featured covers of Roll Over Beethoven. Great Balls of Fire, and a Chuck Berry medley. So I can definitely see where some of the album's heavy criticism comes from in this case. But being derivative doesn't really feel like enough justification to brand this the worst album ever. Okay, the song Baby Come Back is apparently a full rewrite of a 60s hit single called Trito Right. It's not like the whole album is directly ripping off other songs and passing them off as their own. Though the guys from Led Zeppelin would know all about doing that, wouldn't they? Hmm. Cliché songwriting would definitely make a bad album sound even worse, but these guys, or Lord Such at least, sound like they were having tons of fun, so I guess the derived songwriting is much less of a focal point to me. But I'm also no expert, or even fan, of 50s and early 60s rock music. Also, there are probably Led Zepp fans that listen to this because of the Page and Bonham connection and would have been disappointed. But luckily for me, I couldn't give two shits about Led Zepp, so that sure doesn't bother me. The musicianship, looking past Lord Such of course, 
is the real saving grace of Lord Such and Heavy Friends. There's certainly a lot of fun had with the guitars, with plenty of soloing and some mixing up with guitar tones, including some nice wah pedal stuff from Page. Interestingly, Page took credit for the wah wah parts, but he made it very clear that he did not play any of the guitar solos on the album. And he even seemed a bit pissed that it was, it was even insinuated that he might have played these solos. I don't know why, because there isn't a single moment on this album where the guitars make me think, wow, this is some fucking awful playing. Far from it, in fact. The way that Page was carrying on made me expect to hear some Fred Durst tier solos. <laughs> Sure, it would have been amusing, but I'm probably happy to hear some good playing. And some of the songs here are genuinely great. Flashing Lights, the song played in Logan Lucky, has so much swagger in its rhythm and riffs. I think the drumming is particularly Bonham-esque. And the song Would You Believe gives off a strong late 60s Beatles vibe, but however obvious its influences are, it's also a rare song in the album that is genuinely catchy complete with backing vocals. It certainly helps to hear some singers better than Lord Such for a change. Obviously there are some songs that are noticeably weaker than the rest, but honestly I think I actually enjoy this album as a whole. So if you think this is the worst album ever, then I doubt you've heard many albums at all. I can certainly write off the Rolling Stone review at least. I mean, who takes them seriously anymore? They probably weren't all that serious to begin with. I never thought I'd say this about anyone really, but frankly, I really respect what Screaming Lord Such was doing, including the political stuff. The guy just rolled along doing what he wanted to do and pushing some boundaries along the way, though he certainly wasn't breaking any laws that I know of. As far as I can tell, he was a decent guy in general, so his notoriety probably comes mostly from being misunderstood by people who weren't ready for his crazy antics on and off stage. And I'm not forgetting that he wasn't a great singer, but he sure as hell was pretty far from being the worst singer-songwriter ever. I mean, if philosophy of the world by the shags can get some praise from actual professional musicians, then people definitely need to back off a bit from Lord Such. Thankfully, for his sake, the reception of Lord Such and Heavy Friends didn't dull his enthusiasm for performing, though it probably was the last he ever saw of Jimmy Page. He still managed to draw in some notable names for his 1972 follow-up album Hands of Jack the Ripper, bringing Noel Redding and Richie Blackmore back to the fray, the latter having already started to establish himself with Deep Purple, and Keith Moon also got his chance to play alongside his idol Carlo Little. Such would continue to perform with a rotating lineup of savages until his death in 1998, which tragically contrasted his wild and upbeat public nature. He committed suicide by hanging, aged 58, having suffered from manic depression for much of his life. And I think that's all I have to say about Lord Such and his heavy friends. So I went in expecting some absolute trash performed by a babbling loon, and instead came out pleasantly surprised with the music and supporting the guy in what he did. I'll probably give each of the albums I look at in this series a rain out of 10, zero being, this album's actually good, fuck you, and 10 being, just go ahead and kill me now. So Lord Such and Heavy Friends gets a 1. So that'll probably be the highest rating I give in this series. Though I wouldn't mind discovering that more of these albums aren't actually that bad since it means I'll be listening to less shit music. So thanks for watching. Leave a like and subscribe if you look forward to more of this possible series. And of course, do share my videos around if you really enjoy. Because the more attention this channel gets, then the more motivated I'll be to make videos for it. Take care everyone. Goodbye.